Right, this is going to be another episode of the Best Damn League Show, period. Obviously, this is a non-Dom episode, but if I had to pick someone to replace Dom for an episode, I would say Peter Dunn, coach of Heretics, is quite a popular guest. People enjoy on these shows now, Peter. It's funny how these things work, because you know one thing that actually I will toot my own horn about in esports is people may not like my style, or they might think like, why does he talk so much? Because so they don't understand basically how hosting works, and what you do to prompt other people. But one thing I will take a lot of credit for in esports is because I try to be over the top and be like entertaining, or at least like keep people engaged. I actually think one thing my content's been pretty good for is I've been able to bring people to the the four who are really interesting people. I already know that. I've seen them in interviews. I've, I've talked to them myself on other shows. But the thing is, it takes people a while, despite what they say in league, to warm up to people just doing analysis. Like, I think people have to be made a little bit palatable. It's why actually sometimes when you have like little barbs with them or you find the right angle to sort of make them seem by, it can be fun in that sense. So I've noticed actually, I feel like as the years go on, you've got more and more and more and more popular. Like everyone loves you now. Everyone, everyone wants to hear you. Just give them 15 minutes soliloquy. Like if anyone saw that reflection we did, like the answers are about 20 minutes long. <laughs> Pretty good, right? I mean, I, I, I don't know if, if, if being on Heretics has, has improved the popularity, okay. but definitely, you know, uh, in 2018, you know, I didn't do these, I didn't do shows at all before 2020. 20, yeah, when I came from Brazil to, to Europe, I, I, I think you were the first person that invited me on a show. And, you know, I, 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 I've, I saw it on my YouTube mentions the other day and I, I watched it and, you know, it's definitely... It's definitely a very different person. Have you come a long way. <laughs> For sure. But yeah, it's, it's, it's always a lot of fun. I, I love being on this show. So, so yeah. Right. Here's my question though. How do you manage? Cause one thing people have always found quite clever about the way you do your Twitter is because you're quite a polite person. It seems like you're really good at like soft flaming things in the scene, but because you're an active coach, it's hard to just reach it or be like this person's bad. Away. You seem to have sort of mastered how to sort of like give the same take without it being too spicy or do, or do, do am I wrong? Does everyone on Twitter go mental anyway? What's it like? I, I mean, they, they go mental anyway, right, but like yeah. the, but obviously you can't say if you're a coach, you can't say somebody's dog shit, right? Like you have to yes. say, uh, you know, they they have a great personality or something like <laughs> that. <you laughs> sure. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, if people don't know, that's another reason, low key, I'll just tell people a little bit of inside baseball. Another reason why some players and pro and actually coaches like doing my shows is because the idea is they do say that. And then I I am like, yeah, they are dog shit. Like, but they can't say that. Like in some every now and then, guys, I just get to be the voice not of the people, but of the actual industry in that regard. I'll tell you what, some pros actually low key love that because they want to flame hard like that, but they also don't want that Twitter following to turn on them. So Basically, there are many factors as to why you might enjoy watching this show. Speaking of which, totally, you know, reasonable segue there. It wasn't at all fast. You might have seen Remain from G2 sharing scrim results, including how many teams cancelled on them. Perhaps you saw Zeph, you probably didn't, he's a nobody, the positional coach from Mad Lions Coy, posting a ranking of how late teams were to scrim. Conveniently, his team's never late. The point is, even your favourite pros struggle to manage their time well and get everything done in a busy day. As a busy gamer yourself, with lots going on in your life, yeah, right, let Factor take care of your food and nutrition with their delicious, never-frozen meals, much like Lane's, much to her, less is chagrin, delivered to your door and requiring a mere two minutes to heat up. That's enough time to get a tasty meal and ready between games, which would apparently be handy for some LEC pros and means you could be good to go by the time the draft lobby has finished. When I'm watching LEC, I often think... I want something more gourmet than this. And just like the LCK and LPL fill that niche for me in esports, Factor has you covered outside of the game with their premium ingredients like truffle butter, filet mignon, shrimp and asparagus. Speaking of scheduling, did you know you can pause or reschedule your deliveries? Get as few or as many as you want in a specific week to suit your busy lifestyle or those around you. Head to factormeals.com slash league show 50 and use the code league show 50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next box now as g2 knows history does not repeat itself but rather rhyme so allow me to again state that's league show 50 at factormeals.com slash league show 50 to get 50% off your first box and 20% off your next box while your subscription is active it's easier than roblox that technically rhyme think about it. right that's the end of the ad we're back into the show now Seamlessly done. Easy. Right. Peter, obviously, 
this is the episode where we know who wins the split and we know the results. So I actually think this is the best one to analyze and go deep on because we don't have to worry so much about like saying something mega and then on the weekend, the team's all just wrecking us and doing all the opposite. So I actually don't want to start with G2. We'll save that. That'll be the dessert, Ooh. right? Because obviously we can tease that into MSI. I actually want to start with, believe it or not, your, well, your old mate, Mac, in vitality. Because I've got to say, mate, when I look at these playoffs, right, Maybe we'll talk about your team in a minute. But when I look at your team, like your team absolutely could have won that series against Fnatic, but you also could have lost to SK. So, you know, there's, there's, there's the give and take on that one. <laughs> Both sides of the ledger. Vitality, though, is actually one of the teams that underwhelmed me in this playoff storm. Mate. I actually really thought when I was watching them get wins and I saw them going against Fnatic, I was like, mate, with how much Fnatic can make mistakes sometimes, this might be doable. Like, there's a world maybe they can even like, get something in the draft here. And I was kind of underwhelmed by that series, mate. I was kind of, look, Fnatic, we all know the like, punching power is up there. It's actually why people hope they'd be able to win games against G2. But what do you think of Vitality? I mean, it's, it's a team that clearly has... I mean, here's the thing. I'll, I'll tell someone. When I recently did a show that's forthcoming and we had to do our all pro list, I can tell you straight up, Peter, it might shock you, but I had two Vitality players on there. I had four on really? top and I had Kazi and ADC. Like, I actually think yeah. these guys are beasts. Man. I actually think in, in different ways, they're not always enabled to carry the games like I think they would. So what are your thoughts on Vitality? Where are you at on this squad? I, I mean, I, I'm going to say that, like... The the weak the weakness of vitality is really really clear, right? Like the if you look at the win rates for their jungle champions, they have positive win rate on two jungle champions, and those champions are Rel and Maokai. I I believe. Let me just quickly just double check to that make makes sure. Sense. Definitely Rel. <laughs> definitely Rel. Yeah, it definitely Rel. Definitely Rel and Maokai, right? And maybe when we talk about Mad Lions, you know, giving them <laughs> giving them Rel two games in a row. Yeah, it's Rel Maokai. Oh, and Brand, but you know, Brand's not in the meta okay. anymore, right? So so they they have positive win rates on three champions, right? And it's very clear why this is. And you know, uh, Douglas is somebody who who has a lot of talent, right? Um, and you know he's come up through the vitality system, but clearly within this team, he struggled a lot in this team, right? Um, and you know I, what I'm going to say about vitality is vitality have made this roster change. Uh, you know, it, it's <laughs> the entire narrative about bringing Linkers in. Um, you know, it's a, uh, it's a, it's all about K Corp. Not <laughs> the whole, the whole oh, narrative sure. about has just become around K Corp. Yes. But actually. What they've done is they've somehow managed to bring in like one of the one of the best jungle talents like of of recent years, and nobody seems to 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 think about what made Vitality, what were Vitality's biggest vulnerabilities. Oh, so people are missing, essentially, that this isn't just like, here's Linkas over Douglas. It's like, actually, this could be the missing piece that makes it the team I'm hoping for. I, go, I was hoping it could be a contender, mate. I thought if they get things yeah. together, they could be in the final against G2. Yeah, I mean, it's scary for us. You know, we, we have to come top four, you know. Sure. And there's G2, there's Fnatic. If Vitality are fixing some of their things, right, you, you know, there's something we're going to have to work out. But let me put it this way. How can I put this in a simple way? If Jankos decided he wanted to, he, he doesn't want to retire, right? But if, you know, let's say he, he decided to retire, Linkers is the jungler who, who, who I would have loved to have on my team. And like this guy is, he's he's incredibly talented. He His his level of of potential, I would say, is higher than Elurias was coming into the league, right? So in 20, to, so obviously Elurias in 2021 grew into his role and then obviously he's, he's like yes. the superstar jungle later. But I would say Linkas in 2024 is at a higher level than Elurias was in 2020. Uh, okay. And obviously this is a player Mac has known for a very, very long time. Uh, he worked with, with Duke, obviously Mac and Duke uh, uh, talk a lot with uh and before he was working with Zen, um, I can't remember his team, but I remember Zen was was his coach. And, you know, those are two coaches Mac has known incredibly well within the scene uh, for, for years. You know, uh, the, these coaches have worked with him for, for combined maybe eight years or something, right? Uh, in assistant coaching role and various roles. So so he, he's he's been, obviously, this is a guy he's been tracking. It's the guy that he's wanted for a long time. He's made no secret about uh, how highly he values this guy. And now they've managed to, to land him. Um, uh, I was surprised that they didn't bring him in at the start of the year, um, but you know things worked out, and and I mean we'll see how he fits in. This guy has a huge amount of talent. I will say that uh, you know I, I I think VTO is a fantastic player. He's not the easiest jungler in the world sure. to. He's not the easiest mid laner in the world to jungle for sure. because of how he likes to play his lane. But but yeah, uh, I mean you, if you want to ask, 
what were Vitality's issues this split? You know, it's very clearly in how they were playing jungle mid. It's very clearly in how they were playing jungle support. Uh, they've recognized the issues and now they've made the, the changes necessary. And, you know, from everything I've heard sure. about Douglas, he, yeah, he's a, he's a good guy, but, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's the issue, right? And that's what Fnatic exploited in this series. All right, let's dive into that because actually those are some things I want to talk about because what I also enjoy is I'm a big fan of doing multi-factor analysis, guys. You don't just take one component, like this guy is the better support and then put him in. I mean, spoiler, when we talk about heretics, that's obviously even going to be a factor there, isn't it? Like a lot of people did think Kaiser was doing well, but the point is, what does he bring to the team? Uh, if you don't know, if you know the LCK, here's the obvious analogy that when we give that one is, that's why even though I think Delight's way better than Lehens, they brought Lehens in because they were firing peanuts. They had no shot calling, so they wanted Lehens to come into it. So if you know how it works in team dynamics, some of these moves are more than just a one for one. So when you say that, that's a point that I feel like was really missed about this team, this split. Remember, last split was one, I mean, it was probably the worst, but it was one of the nightmare fuel Hillersang splits. It was one of those ones where there isn't the upside, like there's not the caps to the claps to the craps. It's just craps all day long in that analogy. And he's just inting the fuck out the game. And in fact, it made people like Kazi look mega elo held. But the f- problem is this split. I, don't, I wouldn't say he played a great split as a support, but he, he played a lot better. He just didn't have those deaths, right? And in doing so, you did see because he was a bit more unlocked. He could do a lot more of the game. But as you say, the synergy people missed isn't jungle AD, it's jungle support. And so if you have an inexperienced jungler who's not good on many champions and quite frankly, sometimes looked a bit lost in the in sort of the plan, as it were, you can have a really hard time playing with Hillersang. Like Hillersang's a very particular type of support. And you kind of got, like, I get the sense from talking to his teammates, you have to kind of read his mind. He's not going to just tell you like, here's how I'm going to do it. Because he, he's know himself he's kind of in, he's kind of an instinct player right so it, it's not just that Daglas on his own was like bad it's it's that it seems like it was a bad fit for those two sure of course and, and i mean i think it's very telling you know what are the two champions that they're doing best on rel can immediately follow even if you're late and maokai i mean anyone can engage on market right yes. so so the the champions which require that split second decision making like they just didn't win on uh and yeah i mean i i fully agree uh on your hit side and then the other angle I want to ask about was the player I'd said, oh, actually, let's just do Kazi first. Because here's the thing. You know what? You've been around a long time, but I'm not going to give you it all at once. Before. Here's what I'll say. You did identify something in Kazi that was special, right? I saw him when he was at the EU Masters before he came. Look, he was good. But like, I never thought he was going to be some like monster player. Like He was good in that first year. But I remember the year they won the championship. I'll always tell people this. There's a reason they were mega at playing from behind because Kazi was not some monster ADC. And in fact, fame Famously, this is the classic meme. He used to just die on the mid wave inexplicably. So even though people told me all these things, oh, but in team fights, you know, he picks the target and stuff, right? I will give him credit, as I did last year, that I do think the like ceiling of his game is now very impressive. Like I say, he's like the EU version of an LPL ADC for me. But the thing that's really impressed me now, I've seen him in a different squad, even after the Mad Lions one last year without Niski, is mate, when I see him now, the first thing I think is mate, the floor on his game has gotten way better. Like there aren't those mistakes that there aren't those deaths for no reason. In fact, he can himself play a sort of painted in a Wakanda Viper-esque where he has to just do everything right. And I feel like there's a lot of matur- maturation and growth must happen to this guy. What do you think of the cars of today? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, the, that was always the thing about Kazi, right? Like he's, Despite his Twitter persona, you know, like he he's he 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 likes to play into that uh, playfulness, but like he's he's very very smart about the game. You know, he's a he's a really good shot caller. I think I I talked about this, you know, on on your shows before, where on Mad Lions, Humanoid was the one who was making the snap second calls, but Kazi was providing a lot of the structure. And yeah, I mean, he he's he's added those flaws to the game, but uh, he's added like he's he's been better on midwave, but also he's he's picked things. The meta has developed in a way which has benefited him as well. Like he's he's the only mid lane, he's the only AD carry who has shown on stage that he's a really good TF player in Europe. You know he can play TF, he can go and he can go and aid in those rotations. He can he you know he's always been the type of guy who's willing to to flash in in team fights. You know and uh, for better or worse. Uh, but now I, I think like his snap second uh, split second decision making is better. And you know if he's the one who's flashing in and uh, he has two players who are more than capable of cleaning up behind, you know, like uh, Vito is, is definitely the type of player who, who is, who's better when he's going second into a team fight and Kazi, you know, uh, the balance on this vitality team is, is, is very, very solid. Uh, and obviously that, that, that gives Kazi a little bit more agency to be able to play to his limit. So, so yeah, I, 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 I agree. 
And then to ask about Forton, I'll just put it this way. This is one of the players, like people might lag on last year's Vitality to make fun of like Bo and Upset because they were mega hyped and obviously the team came 10th. The player I felt the worst for wasn't even them. I mean, friends were upset. I even told me I feel bad for the Photon guy. Like this is another player moved to another region speaking in a second language. Even had one teammate that's speaking second language English and Bo to him. I mean, technically they all are. The thing is about Photon, I used to look at his game and not only was he having to speak second language English in a totally different region. Not, and by the way, if people don't know, like Koreans like learn learn English, but they're not having to use it daily and be fluent in it when they're in Korea. So I thought this guy's had a really tough task. And then in the games, yeah, look, you could watch and as a classic top laner, Alfari used to get this all the time, people would go, who cares that you won lane or did well in your matchup? What did you do in the team fight? And I used to be like, bro, we don't even know like if he has good comps given to him. We don't know if these players can understand what he wants to do in the game. So I felt like he had one of the toughest tasks ever. So when I have a player like that, Peter, and I think the team's breaking down, I try to look at it like a solo queue game and ask, right, if this guy doesn't have great comms given to him, great shot calling, if there's not great synergies, what just what can he do with the pieces he's given? If you give him these champions, you give him these lanes, I think this guy, he smurfs sometimes, mate. I think I've seen the yep. same thing this year. Even when there's games they've lost, sometimes this guy just does the business. And, and I keep saying this to people. I don't really know if LCK cares about LEC anymore. I do think they think we're below them, unfortunately. But if you guys keep fucking around and think this guy sucks in Europe, some LCK coach with half a brain is going to see him and just say, come back home, mate. Like, we could just put you in a team tomorrow. And I, listen, I think he could be in like a fucking damn one type team. Here. He could be in a good team. Like, this guy has talent. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, he has talent for sure. I mean, it, the I'm... I'm 95% sure. Wait, let me think. I mean, yeah, I mean, he's the only import. So when I came back to Europe, there were like seven or eight imports within the league, and he's the only one that's still here. I mean, Chasey isn't here anymore. Bo, if rumors are to believe, is out. Evie and Ruby aren't here anymore. No, but you're right, because Malran's uh, gone. I think they're all gone, yeah. Yeah, yeah but they're, they're all gone, right? And he he's... And Noah obviously joined, joined oh, sure. later, right? He wasn't there from the start of the year, right? So, so like, everyone everyone else is gone, but he's the, he's the guy who's still here. He's consistent. You know, he's... He has one or two champions he's not the strongest on, but, like, he, he he's very, very consistent. He has a good Jace, which is, like, a rarity in Europe. It and, is, yeah. Um, yeah, he has a good TF, and the he's 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 been very very solid. Um, I don't think I think because of the language barrier, it makes it kind of hard for them to play strong side top. But he's he's been he's been solid. He's been solid for sure. Because he's another person I look to, and I think, mate, if this jungler coming in isn't just hands, he's got a brain. This is another player that could just be unlocked. Like, I can say, that, like one of the nightmares this guy has, as you say, is he's one of the only Western players I would ever even let lock a fucking Jason. Because the rest of them, yeah. like, even if they win the lane, they don't play LPL style. They'll never use it around the map and just clean up, right? If you could yeah. unlock this guy, he could win some games for you. He could just be the main carry. Yeah, I mean, I mean, he when when Vitality had their deep run in playoffs, I think when they when they were top four. Uh, he was for sure the best player on that team. Oh, he was, uh, like, yes. uh, and yeah, I mean, like I said, he's 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 here. He's still around. He's consistent. Um, obviously, I hope it doesn't work out for the course, benefits of everything. <laughs> but but uh, but yeah, uh, it's he, he's definitely a strong guy. I mean, uh, a strong player. It's like sometimes to play as off, sometimes not the strongest on off-meta picks. You know, his smolder was was not the best. Um, but but you know. Uh, uh, he can play. He can play the whole whole range of things. You know, the, but the question is, when you have Kazi and you have Photon on your team, how are you not managing to to do better? You know, and top four. You know, as a coach who's top six, it it's uh, it's it's a bit much for me to say. Yes. But you know, obviously, Vitality recognized they came fifth, sixth. Uh, wait. Fourth. Yeah, uh, fourth, fourth. Yeah, sorry, uh, not fifth, sixth. Uh, they won their fifth, sixth, but they came fourth and they're like, okay, we still need to make an improvement if we want to go and compete. And yeah, let's see how it works out for them. I mean, they definitely have strong pieces for sure. By the way, being as you brought the topic up, I do want to ask about this. How does Chasey manage to win the fucking LEC and then not even be in the LEC the following year. Like, look, I was never someone who thought he was, like, insane. But I tell you what, I did used to think, he maybe he's a bit coin flipping, but he has games he carries too. And he had lanes he carries, yep. certainly had champions he was good. So how does a guy just end up not completely not in the LEC? I mean, you know, it sucks that he has, it sucks that he has a Korean passport. <laughs> okay. I mean, let's, leave, let's leave it there. You know, maybe if he had a, a, more, a more appropriate passport, you know, maybe he would, he would, have, a, he would have an LEC team. Okay. Right. What about then? 
Let's just do a little bit about your team because people want to know this, right? <laughs> so first things first, let's just do this whole topic. You, you're a big boy. You can figure out how to answer it and you can figure out what not to answer. I'll give you that. I'll always give you that space, mate. So the problem goes that the drama around the Perks replacement basically took over even any analysis about the replacement because, unfortunately, it kind of looked like internally there was some sort of Disagreement. I mean, but remember that statement Jankos made, which people couldn't tell. Is he doing it because Perks is his mate and his old like, legendary player who helped him go to the top? Or is he doing it because actually he's kind of shocked this move has happened? And it was kind of implied. I mean, basically, it's what the, was even suggested in that video. It's kind of implied this wasn't like, right, at the end of the last split, we sat down, we had the whiteboard. We said, like you're saying about Vitality, this wasn't a good enough placing for us. We need to level up. So what's the position we could change? Here's the player that would improve, you know, system dynamics in the team and the mid lane. So it's actually going to be Perks for Zvi who they'd had a million years waiting in the background. It wasn't that, apparently. Apparently, it was some sort of, like, late-in-the-game call in the boot camp. It just happened. Now, well, we'll see. This is why it's a perfect time to ask about it. Yeah. I think it's worked out. It's looked awesome. We can get that in a second. But just yeah. give me, what are your initial thoughts of, like, making this change in the team? Okay. So, I think, first thing we can we can go and say is, firstly, it wasn't planned, right? Uh, and you can tell it wasn't planned because, I'll be clear, Heretics, this split, had 11, well, 16 scrim days. People were sick, but basically, you know, it, we are a team that made best of threes. We made the second round of best of threes, and we've had 16 scrim days as as a team of five. So, so it it wasn't it wasn't planned. I'm guessing another uh, team would have had, like, another week or something before as well, right? Two, 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 two weeks. Two right, weeks, two weeks. right. Uh, uh, and, okay, so, first thing. Second thing. Um, I think that uh, a lot of um, I, I think that Zwaru is a player that heretics have had for a long time. Um, I think that you know I see a lot of people now that he's had a successful split coming out and saying, "Oh, you know, he should have been in the team from sure. uh, from you know winter 2023." Sure. Uh, I don't know how much I'm at liberty to comment about that, but basically, I would say that nobody uh, that with the information heretics had at the start of winter 2023 that wouldn't have been the right time but right. definitely you know from from summer 2023 onwards he's somebody that that the team had had really close eyes on and he i will say you know maybe heretics make the finals of eu masters in in summer in summer 20 uh, in you know the first split of 2023 he's playing in lec in in summer you know maybe if uh he's uh maybe if scrims are like slightly better or if like one thing goes in slightly different he he there's a chance he would have been promoted in summer there's a chance he would be, be promoted in winter it's always been really really on the edge with you know some people arguing in his favor some people arguing against but it's it's been really really close so this is a guy he he has the right mentality for lec when you have a rookie that comes into the league uh they um you can tell immediately if they have a chance to succeed, right? Because a rookie, they'll come into the league, they'll be surrounded by all these veterans, and they'll be thinking, "Holy shit, I can, I can, I can be carried by these guys. I can just be my normal self, uh, and I, I, you know, I, I can just sit here and be a passenger." And when things start to go wrong, you know, it's kind of a victim mentality. You're like, "Oh no, woe is me! I'm surrounded by all of these people. Uh, why, why are they not carrying me as hard as I thought that they were going to from the outside?" You know, and Zwaru, you can tell immediately if a rookie ha doesn't have it. If this is the mentality they go into when things are rough, and things will always go rough, right? Like there's unless maybe G two, right? Uh, but like, so so he's never had that kind of like victim mentality. He's always been really really proactive. You know, he's the type of guy who, you know, when we lost the BDS series, he's calling Trimby and Yankos. He's the guy who's saying to Trimby and Yankos, "Let's go office uh, nine p.m. <clears throat> tomorrow night. We're going to go and watch some games together. You know, we're we're not playing we're not playing mid jungle support well." let's 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 go and talk about it let's let's go and talk about it uh, as a as a three and the, so so to be clear it's not just any random guy being promoted it's like zwaru he he's he, he has it right uh the question could be why was he not promoted earlier that's a very interesting okay. question maybe, maybe for another day okay so 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 first things first second thing um there is never so the pub so there's a lot of people within the scene who know what happens but who who have a good idea of what had hap what's happened, but cho choose not to say anything about it because they don't want to damage their relationship with the players, right? And it's very easy for somebody from the outside to go and shit on an org and say, oh, you know, they're clueless, they have no idea what they're doing and that kind of thing. What I would say is 
these kind of decisions, a decision to promote a rookie over like a legend of the game isn't something that just happens overnight. It's not nice. like a it's not something you take lightly and it's not something that that is done without multiple steps. I mean, here's the the uh, analogy classically is this wasn't really like people think like, you know, Perks just had some sort of argument and they were like, get out, you're fired. And it's like some crazy like tyrant. No, based on the things I'd heard, again, this is like the classic analogy is the straw that broke the camel's back. There were other things in the background, could be performance, it could be anything else. And this was just like, this is the trigger moment where the decision is made. Yeah, I I think, I think that's, that's kind of an accurate way of describing it. Right. Uh, And I would say, you know, it, it was frustrating uh, uh, from from f- within the team, you know, that things that th- things turned out this way. But you know, I'm glad I'm glad uh, uh, Arthur uh, Zwaru uh, showed showed his potential kind of in playoffs. But yes. but like I said, you know, these kind of decisions from the outside, you know, m- maybe maybe they're things that orgs can do to better communicate uh, these kind of decisions and communicate logic. But you know, sometimes you don't want to say bad things about about your your employees sometimes you want to protect people sometimes you want to uh sometimes th- there's reasons why you can't share kind of everything openly right uh, but in a case like this it's easy to see if you don't share everything it's easy to see why people will rush to their own conclusions the thing which shocked me a lot about the situation though is firstly kind of every like almost everyone knows i, I would say uh, a lot of people know what happened but people choose not to say that who are outside the org, right? Uh, which is which is interesting as well. Um, but but yeah, uh, like I said, uh, it's not just anyone being promoted. It's it's a case of accumulation of things that happen for 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 a long period of time. And you know, I think Arthur uh, is. Uh, I, I would say that okay. So so I, I, maybe I could talk about one more thing. I could talk about. So so Wanda talked a little bit about how the the team is now a little bit more uh, in terms of. Uh, on the same page about how they kind of want to play the game. And one thing I will say about Arthur, uh, about Zwaru, sorry, is he's very, very keen to play the game at a very, very fast pace. You know, he's the type right. of guy, he, he'll drop two waves on mid, mid lane to dive bot. You know, if he can lose three CS on one wave to make sure bot lane is denied a plate in one wave because he's st- sitting in fog, literally sitting in fog, not showing on the mid wave, not even rotating, but he's willing to like play around fog better. He's not going to greed his tempo, you know, to try to go and get a tower you know he's very he plays the game very very fast he plays the game very very lpl style almost you know uh he he's more like the uh <laughs> he's more from the doi b school than the than the chovy school right, right. Uh, and uh you know on a team like this with with people like trimby with people like yankos who, who really really want to play the game at a very very high level but force the opponents to make mistakes uh, i think he's a really really good fit um obviously uh, he is also playing with with Trimby as well, so who who takes on a lot of burden of shot calling. So maybe maybe that ov- obviously helps him uh, helps him as well. He's he's the type of guy who if somebody makes a call, he will snap. He will snap follow the call right like this uh, if it's required. Yeah, that's what I would say. One thing I would say about this is if we take some of the facts that you're addressing here, I think suddenly his split makes so much more sense. Like, if people remember, in the regular part of the split, he was kind of just all right. I, my point was, look, he's not having any perks in games. That's a good factor. And it's allowing other people. You can see the Trimby factors clearly taking over the team and influencing it. But if I take the fact you just told me, essentially he started playing games, guys, with barely any scrim days. He's just playing with all these veteran players who have their own idea of the game, and he just has to go into LEC. So I don't blame him for just being okay. At that point, Yep. time you're not hating on him but the glow up in the playoffs there's another fact people need to know so one this guy is 25 years old he isn't a 17 year old rookie he's a rookie in the sense he hasn't been experienced in the LXC but he's played the game a while and I think I can tell you it, it showed in the playoffs his poise is way better than I would expect not just a rookie but someone who sk- I didn't even get the first split to get out your system he just came into the playoffs and then obviously he didn't play Azir at all in the regular split it's one of his best champions ever guys when he was put onto the Azir the glow up was real mate like he wasn't just like not inting, he was to carry. In fact, there was even games where I saw where you lose him, where he was still doing work, mate. He was still proactive. He yep. still looked like he was making play. Also, he didn't do the Azir that uh, someone would do if they were a coward rookie, mate. Which is you play very scared. You always go backwards. He was going in. He was doing like the humanoid fucking mechanics moves on it. I love yep. it when people play Azir like that. So already, I'm kind of in there. I bought in. What, what's this guy's? What's he doing? What's his impact? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, uh, I think I think he he's fearless. Um, I think also it's worth saying that 
before playoffs, before the BDS series, Heretics were 224 in scrims uh, going into BDS series oh. because we just had multiple people getting sick. You know, we had day after day after day where people would just be like, it would, you know, it, we were spreading the infection, you know, around to everyone. And I think there was something that, we, that just like kind of clicked in him during that week where we were kind of like losing every scrim. You know, reviews were really hard. You know, maybe we should have just not scrum, scrim, but like, you know, it's a new patch, first playoffs. We're already behind in scrims. So um, so, so we're, we're trying to grind out the scrims. But at some point, something clicked, which is like, you know, I need to carry because other people are sick. And the, if I don't carry, you know, who else is going to? Like, what happens if what happens if somebody else is sick on the weekend because it was just spreading? You know, he's he's a very gym focused guy. I don't think he gets sick that often. Um, but he's uh, he yeah, that, that's what I would say about him. He he's completely fearless. And I would say the one thing, like for people that don't know Zwyver very very well over the years, there's one thing which has always been like in terms of team fighting, he's always been like top two mid laners in 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 uh, in the right. ERLs. You know, he's been he's been LEC level. Like if you'd ask me. Uh, last year where he would have been a top five team fighting mid laner but the thing that people have always criticized Wario for is number one his laning phase and number two uh kind of his movements on the map right i think his movements on the map over the time when i've worked with him on heretics and not just not because of me but because of the entire staff and everything has improved a lot but there was always a question is this guy good enough in lane to to compete at the LEC level and then you know oh he's 25 if he was going to develop his learning phase why hasn't he developed it now and it's very obvious when you look at this guy this is just the guy who needed to go and play caps in lane play humanoid in lane and just get fucked right over and over again so he can recognize where his flaws are because there's a cap you reach in the ERL that you can never get better than because you're just not being challenged in your learning phase uh, and I think this is kind of where he kind of reached like by the time he got to playoffs it kind of clicked and this is no secret you know like I, 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 uh, you know, he, he himself has 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 gone on about like how how rough his laning phase has been at, at points. But now I think now that he's kind of got it out of the system, now he he's used to like the faster pace. You know, the more aggression, he knows when people are bluffing. He knows when he can push his limits. I think that I think I think he he has a lot of potential for summer. He, I don't I don't know if he'll get there immediately, but he definitely you know I, I see I see signs that this laning phase issue is not something that can't be fixed. Um, it, it was just a case of playing against stronger opposition, I think. And then the other obvious team dynamic aspect I want to ask about is the addition of Trimby. But the way I'll ask it is this. If indeed it wasn't planned to remove perks, then I know, look, I know Kaiser was your boy, a guy who had respect for him. He thought he could rehabilitate I think he did rehabilitate him. Yes, he did a pretty good job there. It's just unfortunately, teams don't sign the players that often themselves at the moment. In fact, that this Zero was the only player change that people don't know. So what I would say is this, as well as Trimby, sorry. These are the only sure. player changes that happen. So if it is a world where last minute perks gets yoinked out, now all of a sudden it's even more valuable potentially to have Trimby because people know, if you've ever heard a voice, it never shuts the fuck up. It's even implied that's why he keeps getting booted from teams, even though if you're watching the server, he levels every team up and they get better and they become like a contender. Yeah. So who is this guy? Because it, I noticed no one's ever had an angle on. Why does he keep getting removed? Because to me, the upside's clear. It's just, no one really knows what the downside is. So what, what has Trimby brought to Heretics? I mean, I think that every player that leaves Rogue leaves with like a, a worse reputation. And like, you, th this is something which which really, really troubles me because I think uh, on the reflection show we did, I talked about Inspired, where Inspired left, left Rogue with this like dreadful reputation yes. of like he, he is the most toxic person on earth he will destroy he's like a team killer he's going to destroy your team environment and then when you meet him sure he's a bit he's a bit direct but he's not like it's not like he, he's running down scrims or anything you right. know like some guys I work with right and I think that this is kind of something that I saw with Tr Trimby Trimby has this kind of reputation as well that like oh you know he's it's he, Sometimes in a team environment, he's not he's not that he's not that good in the team environment. But again, the same thing is inspired. You know, he's <laughs> he's he's a little bit. Um, you know, Polish people can sometimes be a bit direct when they when they interact, sure. but it's it's never coming from a bad place. And uh, what I would say about Trimby is, firstly, you're right. He never talk. He never stops talking. And I mean, <laughs> at some point, you know, he has to. If he could talk like eighty percent of what he talks, he would okay. be like the perfect support. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, but you know, his ideas are good. He's very 
he's very very decisive he always wants to fight no matter what you know sometimes um he, maybe he can slow the pace down but there's no question he, he when you bring him into the team he brings decisiveness he brings uh he's he's he knows how to he knows on the what he wants to do on the map he won't he he's not the type of support you know it for support sometimes you need to kind of force your resets on the team you know you don't have vision but your team wants to go and make an aggressive play, you have to be really decisive and say, no, I need this reset now. It's really important. Otherwise, you know, we'll get all this pressure, but we won't leave any vision behind. And I've seen a lot of supports kind of get bullied out of their resets, but Trimby will never be bullied out of his reset. You know, right. if he wants a reset, he's getting his reset and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, and that's what I would say about Trimby. Trimby is somebody you will never lack decisiveness. The 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 thing that, that he... He, I think, at his best, it's uh, he's at he 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 needs to he needs to. I think that the reason why Trimby is a legendary like ranged support player, you know, like Jano or or Lux or all of these things that he he's super super good on Lulu. You know, these champions are not champions where you kind of force. You know, you force the enemy to force onto you, and that kind of lets you play a backseat and kind of look at the map more. And I think that that is that that that's something. You know, obviously Trimby new to the team. Obviously Trimby's also had the same issue. Come into a new team, had a roster change, uh, and he's had to adapt to that as well. But I think, uh, I think that uh, you know, it's he's definitely one of the most decisive people I've 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 ever worked with. And I think, yeah. you know, he's also been the player who was I think kind of sick the most the split. So the fact he was able to put up these performances is is a promising sign. If we talk about BDS, I have to say, I actually think they underperformed this split. They absolutely could have been in that final. I mean, if you watch the series, that's a fucking robbery that Fnatic got away with that. I mean, look, they aided in the robbery. They sort of handed them the bag of money on the way out, as it were. But I really thought, like, there's a world they were in the final. In fact, it's one of the reasons why... In, even though it's reigniting the beef from last year, why Nuke just hates me on Twitter because he knows that my take goes like this and every player in BDS fucking hates this take. My take goes like this. I actually think they have like the fourth or fifth best roster in LEC, but I think that fucking striker and the coaching staff just work miracles, mate. Like they, they have trained those players in a way where I've watched enough league to know when people are like macro geniuses or understand setups or when they've been coached to do that, they've been coached to be on the same page. They've been coached, by the way, to know how to play around like, the most idiosyncratic top laner ever to play around people like Nuke, who on the one hand can look strong if you set him up in the right way, but he clearly, if you just dropped him into any random team, he wouldn't like just carry 1v9 out of nowhere. So they've got all these strains, but they removed Crowny, who was the most surefire carry position. They even, this is also another sign, they played through Adam Lasper and now they came back to the Crowny style without Crowny and the ice guy did it. He, he was the stat stick here. But he, he was actually able to carry the games when they put him on those comps. And I keep telling people the way they win these games where essentially like they just catch throws of mistakes from the opponents. These, these are all just hallmarks of coaching guys. So the problem then becomes if you're the players, you don't want to hear that. You want to hear that like, no, we're the best players. Like I am the best top laner. Nuke wants me to tell him he's the third best mid laner in LEC and that, you know, he's like a future star and they don't want to hear that Ice is just doing his job. It's like, no, no, he's a, he's a great import. So I get why the players get offended by this but this is my question to you the reason that they have the beef with me goes like this when I see that team I think to myself mate if you could shuffle some of the rosters up and this team stayed together but they were like the fourth best team so they were like on the skirts outskirts of competing for the world spot but not like a top top world spot but you know they get to go go and play and then prove themselves then LEC would be an amazing region would be so strong because they're amazing with that style at gatekeeping teams that make mistakes you can even be a better puncher like Fnatic and if you make mistakes they'll catch you they'll, this team will kill you they'll win the team fight against you so I actually thought right to me the problem becomes last split and this split if they're sort of spiritually the second best team we're in kind of a tough spot in the region because if they can gatekeep us like that boys what do you think is going to happen when an LCK elite team comes and plays us around an objective or in a team fight you know what I mean like I, I start to worry so where are you at on actually some of the players in BDS and some of the style where, what's your take I'm sure you have some disagreements so give me a yeah, yeah. no no I'm um, so 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 I think I think I, I'm not I'm still not convinced that ice is an upgrade on on Crowny. Oh, I don't uh, think so either, but I know why they don't ever want Crowny again. That's nothing to do with the sure, game, mate. So. Sure, sure. Uh, um, but, it's not an option so in that I, case. What I would say, though, for BDS is I kind of agree with you for BDS last year, but I think that there's one player we didn't talk about, which was Labrov. And okay. I think that the difference between BDS last year and BDS this year is that Labrov has kind of gone from like a mid-tier support player, you know, maybe overshadowed by, by, more, by stronger teammates to being like one of the best supports. Some people think he is the best, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm actually. 
He carries a lot of yeah, games. I, I could see it. I could see it. Yeah. I could see it. This yeah. Yeah, I could, I, I could see it. I mean, MB, uh, all pro voting is coming soon. So, yeah, actually, I could see it. But he gives he gives BDS, like, this kind of X factor. Like, the way that he plays, he plays his map movements in the mid game. He, he even, I would say that he's he had been even better than Mickey this split. You know, he knows when he yeah. needs to be on the sideline. BDS are kind of the only team besides G2 in the league that can pull off a proper 2-1-2. You know, they they know when to play side into mid. They know how to play mid into side. You know, they they know how to play. Like, you cannot let this guy... You, before with BDS, you could just, like, wait and outscale and, uh, you, you know, they were going to try to catch your throw. But if you didn't throw... You could be, you could, you could scale into the game, provided you didn't give them too many dragons early. But I think the difference this year is that Labrov now gives them kind of like an X factor. He'll do something crazy, right? He's not gonna, he's not gonna do something as crazy as Hillisang, but he's gonna, he's gonna, he's gonna kind of trap you on the side lane. He's gonna like be annoying, right? You, you, he's gonna play with fog really, really well. And I think the best example of this is the BDS Fnatic. There was a second game, BDS Fnatic, and Fnatic picked. Maokai Lulu as their uh, jungle support, which, I mean, I'm sure we'll talk about Fnatic later, but you should never pick Maokai Lulu if you're Fnatic, um, which in, on paper is really, really good, right? Like Maokai Lulu, they're strong champions, they have good synergy, you know, they're going to teamfight well. But the problem is, it's very, very hard for a Maokai Lulu to stop a Rakan being able to do what he wants to do in the mid game. You know, like they're really good at sitting on an objective and forcing you to face check into into you and forcing you forcing forcing you to um uh forcing you to uh to to, to come into kind of their zone of control. But you know, a Lulu Maokai is not sitting two v one against a mid against an AD carry on mid midway. You know, maybe you have your AD carry, your support, and your jungler there. You're never. It's going to be really really hard for you to force. Uh, with numbers advantage on midwave, which means that Rakan now can do whatever he wants to do on the side lane, knowing that you're not going to be able to dive his dive his AD carry underneath the mid lane turret, and he just destroyed he he just destroyed the entire game with his map movements. Uh, and I think that's the thing that BDS have gained. You must have tools to fight BDS because if you don't, their Labrov is going to get you. Um, or, or you need to be able to match his his rotations. And I think I think that's what makes BDS scary. Um, but yeah, uh, but that, that's, is that a coaching thing? Is that a team comfort thing? It's, it's hard to say, but for sure, he's not the player that he was two years ago. Right. Uh, for sure. And then another player I have to ask about, because I just feel like kind of a fitting analogy. He is the problem child of LEC that works on so many levels. Obviously it's Adam, right? Because you know what, Peter, what people will never know about me is it's not that when I say it's a persona, it's all fake. I always give this analogy. I just put more mustard on the hot dog. It's still a fucking hot dog. Like I'm still going to give you the real meat and, and veg of it, as it were, and the truth of what I think. So look, I did think Adam was a bit of a joke when he first came in the league. He was someone who played only those champions and he relied that you just hadn't played into those champions and that if you were a top player, you actually thought, what the fuck's he picking this for? I'll beat this. Like, I played it once since all luck you ever and then you got beat by him. He, on that team, where they had, by the way, the best bottling, you were just getting beat and he had Whipple jungling out of his mind. He had, he had the best setup I've ever seen. Then when he got booted to BDS originally, there's a reason they kicked him out. He actually just looked like, man, he's a fucking liability if you put this guy in the game. Like, even on his champions, he could lose the game and lose the lane and fucking pressure too much, get ganked all day long. Then when he came to last year, they were figuring out how to use that though the difference is he got into this coach is that I thought it was quite interesting the way they were using him putting him in and out the way they would sort of I mean the joke is I always make fun of Monty because Monty's so generous in trying to think strategically he would make it sound like it was the game plan for Adam to play pushed up so it's like he's making an island and what he's doing is drawing pressure so that Crowley can carry the bottle and I was like Monty I wish that was true mate but I, I guarantee you if I drop Adam in any other team with no bottle he's doing the same anyway the difference this year and this is how cursed it actually seems his career is is the week before he got benched. I finally gave it up to him on Twitter. I said last week, I actually think he's the best top in LEC now. He's playing, they can play through him. He actually had some meta champions. It wasn't a joke if he went to a Zion or a Renekton or something. He can actually play that out and win the game from it. He was more reliable. Then he got benched. And I don't feel like the peak player I saw came back. Like, I've seen it. Now he feels that you're, you roll a dice again. You know, maybe you get a good game here and there. That's why I, I feel like they don't, I mean, I know the meta change, but they don't play around him always. So where is Adam at for you? He's obviously such a difficult player to like, even figure out. I mean, when you have Adam, when you're playing against Adam, top lane counter pick is really valuable. And I mean, in, in the Fnatic series, you know, game one, they pick, the enemy team pick TF. TF's strongest champion on, uh, strongest top lane champion on the patch with Rex'Ai out. 
uh, and they just murdered him. They they just picked like Sejuani Yasuo into TF, and they just camped camped him to the point where he he was like 50 CS down. And you know I, that's what I would say about Adam. I think Adam is uh, he's he 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 loves to push his limits. But the the annoying thing about Adam is if he gets an advantage now, he doesn't push his advantage top lane one v one. He goes to mid lane, he goes to jungle, he like makes uh makes the enemy jungle life jungler's life hell. He'll like fight you level one, two v one when you're leashing blue buff or something like this. He'll always do things which he's very, very hard to predict. And I think that sometimes the the thing with Adam is is he doing something which is What's the rationale be- behind what he's doing? You know, is he is he being cheesy for the sake of being cheesy, or is he somebody who is like, uh, how are they refining what he wants to do in the game? And I think this is where, like, it, this is why with Labrov, it's hard to work out: is this Labrov's improvement, or is this like Adam's improvement for getting Labrov to play around him better? Because because last year, yes, Adam would just go to sideline and he would literally die. And like, if you were behind against BDS and you weren't sure what to do. Go and camp at him, right? Like it's 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 that simple, right? Um, because Nuke isn't gonna die, you know, he's just gonna play safe yes. on the side lane. So so you just go and kill Adam. Um, but this this split, like you try to do that, and Shio and um Labov are in the bush behind him, or or like you know they'll play into his lane, and then he'll immediately rotate. And th- this is what I think. This is what I think. Uh, uh, I, I think that they found a way to play around him. I have no idea why they benched him. Um, before, who knows? before the, yeah. uh, who knows? I mean, it was good for Mad Lions for sure. I mean, sure. It helped them. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, but the, but yeah, it was, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, this playoffs they should have beaten Fnatic three zero. They like, I, uh, yes. I, I mean, so, and then they beat MSI, and then who knows? You know, so, so yeah. Right. The if we move on now and talk a bit about Fnatic, I have to just start in one place. I know there's a, the funny thing about this team is you can absolutely go into all five players. It's quite interesting. I actually think it's quite interesting the way they've evolved from last split and they showed like a little bit more consistency, even though they can still every series with these guys. They're never going to three zero anyone, mate. Like they, I don't think this team could three zero any team in the league. Is the joke in a best of five? Because the problem is the sit. This is what I keep pointing out. This is where people go on results when they build their narratives, not on the game and build the narratives out the game because what happens is when they win a game and they do all pop off and you have like a Jun performance mixed with Razork demon mode all over the map Humanoid does like some fucking Azea shenanigans Oscar and wins the top line. everyone wants to go like wow look at this the great thing about them is like their firepower they're willing to fight they're willing to take the fights and force the fights and extend the fights and it's like bro that's how they lose every game too like go watch all the games they lose like this is the team that like that's why I was so scared BDS was going to beat them mate I was like this is the team where they could knock BDS the fuck out but essentially, if BDS is like the counterpuncher in this analogy, they're going to get a lot of fucking chances to counterpunch. They're going to get a lot of moments where you're going to be sat like in the chalk or in the fucking brush. Like, I wish they didn't go into us. And they're going to, Fnatic's going to come into you. They're just going to go for that fight. So the first player along this style, I feel like I have to ask you about is, we've seen Razork play for years now. For me, every season he gets better, mate. It's why actually, yep. I think people did correctly identify him as kind of a stud on that Misfits team. And each year, he seems to add a little bit more to his game. And for me, it's like... He's he's the, he's what they follow. He's the tip of the spear on this team. What do you think about Fnatic and Razor? Okay, so first thing, disclaimer: I'm Heretics coach. So obviously, every Heretics player is top five, you know, in the league, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so okay, leaving that aside, non Heretics players in the league, um, Razor is the second best player in the LEC. Like, uh, uh, Caps is Caps is number one, and Razor is number two. And the reason why I give Fnatic the chance to cause some upsets internationally is because they have Razork on their team and he can always do something crazy in the early game. And, uh, you know, I think before Worlds, we talked about contracts on NRG. You know, maybe NRG can shock some people because they have a jungler who can be aggressive, who could do crazy things, who can like snowball game out of control. And Razork is... He's he's become more creative. I think when he came into the LEC, he's somebody when he was in ERLs, he he had a reputation of being not not the most confident person, right? Uh, uh, but he's definitely come into his own this split. I think I think he's I, I think he's he's been he's been um, he's been incredible. Uh, and I think that basically, in the BDS series, the two games that BDS won, they basically took him out of the game. Um, first game because they had a really smart plan for how they were going to play around top jungle to stop him being able to play. Second game because Fnatic picked him on Maokai, uh, which you should never put Razok on uh, in this Fnatic team. <laughs> sure. you know, maybe in a different sure. team because this Fnatic team, everyone is just going to fight to the death in their lanes, right? They're going to play super aggressively, so you need a jungler who can take advantage of that, and Maokai is not that jungler. Um, 
but then um from that point onwards he grew and grew into the series um and you know he had he was i think a really really key factor for them beating bds but then you look at the finals and i so i hate the lane swap meta because uh, n- not because i i hate lane swaps i love lane swaps right like I, as a coach it's super super fun you can look at all the strategic stuff but g2 stopped g2 basically won the final by default because they kept lane swapping. Oscar had zero clue what to do in the lane swap. He was so bad. None of those games were like standard standard lanes. You know, there, there, there were like three lane swap games. And one of them, the fourth game was like Broken Blade, Open Bot, and then TP Top after like making a play level one, right? And basically, Oscar solo loses the game because he doesn't push the wave into the tower. So, so uh, um, before he TPs, uh, so uh, Broken Blade... TP's back to a frozen lane and is in a really, really strong position. Like, it's literally solo lost at two, two minutes 15 into the game um, because Oscar do- literally doesn't know what to do in these situations because maybe he's never experienced yeah, them. Totally maybe, useful, yeah. you know, yeah. but, but by lane swapping, G2 take away everything Fnatic is, is good for in the early game. You know, Fnatic want to fight you to the death and they want Razok to do unpre- unpredictable things and attack the enemy jungler. And if you're lane swapping, you know where Razok is going to be. You know, maybe Broken Blade shouldn't die to the four-man dive, you know, multiple times in the series. But you know that Razok has no ability to, like, be unpredictable on the map. He he has to be with his on his strong side of the map because, you know, you're lane swapping. So you can't you can't go to the weak side of the map because enemy team is going to be outnumber you three on one or three on two, right? So you can't you can't do anything there. So So they know where he is at all times. They know he has to show. They take away all of his unpredictability. They take away all of Fnatic's ability to snowball. And even in the first game, where they have this like massive, massive lead, they're not able to do anything with it because because the gold is not kind of on the in the right places. And if Razok, I just wish G2 and Fnatic had played each other like in standard lanes, so I could get a good idea of where Fnatic are because I because I I I I feel like Fnatic have the potential to really really do damage at this MSI. I don't look. They're not gonna. They're not gonna stomp Gen G, right? Like I'm not saying they're gonna three zero Gen G, right? But they I can win games, they, though, right? They can definitely win games. Like I, I, I would be shocked if Fnatic got three zeroed by any team at, at MSI, right? Uh, uh, because because un- unless the enemy team finds a way to shut down Razor, but I can't judge this because this is a team that should have lost three zero to BDS, but then again they self sabotage themselves. So uh, you know, um, and then they managed to reverse sweep. This is a team that, uh, you know, was in a losing position against Heretics in, in game two. They oh, they could have lost a lot of these series, yeah. yeah. Sure. <laughs> and they and then against G2, we didn't get a final because G2, like, refused to play the game properly. Um, you know, and th- that sounds like criticism on G2. Sure. No, fuck that. You know, just go and win your championship. You know, if you have a free championship, sure. go and win it, right? Um, but... But yeah, like Razork is the key man, and at MSI we'll we'll see. Like I'm really interested to see how how T1 you know try to try to attack him. Uh, it'll be really interesting. I have to ask because obviously disclaimer: Peter Dunn was the Mad Lions coach, so your boy humanoid. I have to ask this question, Peter. So there's a classic saying I am very often want to refer to repeat, and it goes like this: You'll have heard it before. If you give a man a reputation as an early riser, he can sleep till noon. And I feel like man alive has humanoid fucking dined out on those not only the championships back in the day, but also all those international globes because he's had when he goes international, he has those like one or two games where he pops off even against the. Team ones and the EDGs of the world. It means that everyone goes, it's always in him. He's got that dog in him, man. And they're doing that right. And so every time it's the LEC, bro, even in the playoffs, he can have a game where he just doesn't do anything or he loses or he gets clapped early in the game. But it doesn't matter. As long as the next game is like, put him on the Azir, put him on this uh, corky, let him go off. If he carries, everyone's like, he's back. It's humanoid. Humanoid time, baby. And it's like, he, he never actually gets the diss. That even, dude, remember when Prime Caps was winning all the championships and people were still like, well, you know, there's claps and there's craps. Like, dude, everyone just goes, it's just humanoid. And they forgive every single game. So where is this guy at right now? Because I feel like he's the hardest player in LEC to rank. Is he actually like the fourth best player in LEC? Is he actually like the fucking fourth best mid lane? Like, who the fuck? You tell me, what do you think of this guy? <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Okay, so first, first thing for Humanoid, he's always been shit at best of ones, but in Spring Split, he was really good at best of ones, because clearly, like, you could argue that he's the reason that they lost the Mad Lions, right, in the winter playoffs, right, in the third, fourth, 
Third, fourth match? Yeah, yeah. Then it was, yeah, third, third, fourth match. Right, so so he made a key mistake, which led to them losing that series, right? So so he came in, super motivated, and he was, like, crushing everyone. Like, we we beat Fnatic, but it, they were 5k gold ahead, right? Um, and we had Smolder, and we, we Smoldered them, but, like, you, you know, like, this guy, he, he came in really, really motivated. Week three, Fnatic seemed to, like, kind of tail off. There are rumors that some of their players were sick behind the scenes. I, 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 it's really hard to say as a coach, but but definitely, like, uh, things seem to be... He, he didn't seem to be his normal self. And then, like, the thing about Humanoid is his decision-making is always good in the mid-game. Early game, sometimes he pushes his limits too much. But, you know, I think that... <sighs> I think that basically this team, this team that he has around him, I, I I feel like him and Oscar don't have really good synergy. Like they don't see the game in the same way. They 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 group at weird times. Like they they team fight in like kind of weird weird ways. Um, and I think Fnatic are at their best when. The enemy team is just five people in front of them. Nobody's trying to flank them. You know, there's no pressure to make the right decision. Just press the go button. You know, may maybe maybe they just should pick Siver. You know, just Siver ult. Just run at the enemy team. Just jump on them and and just hope to outplay play with your mechanics, right? Um, but I think this is a lot because, like Oscar, I feel that Oscar sometimes he's on he's in the wrong, like he feels pressured to do things. Like he's really really. He, He'll he'll TP too early into a situation on the map, sure. or he'll like he'll um, he'll he won't push a wave that he's supposed to wave, or he'll go on the wrong side in a team fight or something like this, right? And I think sometimes I wonder how much agency he has in this team to make the calls himself, right? So so obviously we we know from the voice comms last year I uh, that Trimby was doing a lot of micromanagement, right? So so it helped it helped fix a lot of the synergy like the humanoid Razok synergy and the like uh the oscar humanoid synergy but but i but i feel that like they're on the wrong page a lot in the mid game and that leads to fanatic will get early game leads because of Razok and because of how they draft and then like in the mid game something will go wrong and when it goes wrong it's normally because either oscar or humanoid are being too passive or too aggressive at at, at weird intervals right so so yeah, so how much of that is on humanoid? How much of that is on Oscar? Maybe more of it should be on humanoid because Oscar's still like kind of a semi rookie, yeah. and humanoid's a veteran. But you know, it's hard to say. You know, I could just see the the conclusion, like what happened as a result. If we talk about G two, the first place I want to start, and I always stress this, is it's easy to look at the roster and go, "Fucking hell!" Like, isn't this like almost the best player at every role? Although actually, this split was a little bit different. I will say, maybe we'll get into that in a second. But you look at the like talents they have, and you, and a naive fan who doesn't understand what coaching is would go, "Well, anyone would win with that team." And it's like, here's what's brilliant, though, guys. Even though I will put the disclaimer that having all those talents is really fucking insane in a draft if you're a coach. Like, you're not working with like you know two or three floor charts like shit I hope they don't take my like pinch player you're working with a scenario where you can fucking roll you can um, pimp flex picks you have ridiculous like especially when Mickey was at his prime you have picks that don't even play fucking support that you can take right you have all these different picks you can do right so that that certainly he's working with the most but mate if people think it's just players winning these championships each split I'm seeing like a Dylan Falco masterclass in terms of like what he comes in with the game plan and what he does in the draft like as you said in this particular case it wasn't even about just like baiting you in the draft like he usually does in this case he actually just made it so that like the other team like the reason why Fnatic didn't have a chance to win the final is like you say in those early games they had no clue what was happening like they, they it, you would you didn't they essentially didn't even get the chance to play League of Legends and actually do what I'm sure they did in all the scrims and were ready for so I feel like again like it's like you say look if you're a, if you're observer of the game it wasn't an amazing final and it wasn't one you'd be like I'm gonna go back and watch that one again wow I can't wait to see what happens because as you say once you see that they can't respond to the lane swaps you actually like. How, how is Fnatic going to win this game? Especially because it's G2. Like, they've got caps. They've got fucking Ad Saber. Like It's going to be incredibly hard. So give me some thoughts as a coach on this aspect. Because I feel like, again, as you say, if you can take a free championship, you just take it. Yeah. I, I mean, basically, they, they should have won four, like 4-0. Four like, the first game that they lost, it's literally Broken Blade. Like, so, so Sin Zhao, he gives Sin Zhao a dash over the wall in a dragon fight, which there's no, like they have Vega, they have Sion and there's, they have to play around Vega cage, right? 
And the Broken Blade steps up for literally no reason, lets Razok jump over a wall um, with his with Sinjal Dash, which he should never be allowed to do, and uh, and get into his backline, right? So it's they literally lose the game off one misplay, um, which is, you know, kind of your tank positioning slightly too aggressively. But it's just a minor misplay, and they got smashed in the early game, but but they should they should have won that game too. Like, it, it wasn't... Let, let's be clear. This this was a 3-1 final, and yes, G2, G2 had some happy, fun times when they're like 8k gold ahead or something like this, where Caps is over-pushing a side lane, or... But Fnatic would never, never had a chance to win this... Had Never had a chance to win this series because of the response of Lane Swap. And this is, I think, obviously... Some of this is obviously we know Mickey and we know Caps. I, I don't know the other G2 members so well, uh, uh, but I know Mickey and Caps have like really, really like insane game knowledge. They're they're really like creative. They 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 watch. They they try to incorporate a lot of things, right? Like one thing I've heard from Mickey's teammates is he is obsessed with ward placement. Like he will literally like spend, yeah a long a lot of time just trying to argue the benefit of placing a ward in one spot versus a spot which is like very very close by and fills a similar role but in one specific situation is like better than better than uh you know uh, this so so you know to have as a coach to have a support that and a mid who care a lot about all of these things it's a big big benefit that said g2 were really really prepped for this final um and you know people i, I agree that Look, D- Dylan, as a drafting coach, has the easiest job in the in the in the LEC. Let, let, let's be clear, right? But we know that Dylan is a good coach for drafting, not because of the times he spent on Fnatic no, no. and the times he spent on G two. It's the times he spent on Schalke, right, yes. where he didn't have a lot. And that's 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 often, you know, sometimes I think coaches who only work with the top teams, it's really hard to see what they Class. what they do and when they're challenged. And but Dylan has proven himself uh, multiple times on different rosters, on different levels of roster, and you know it's really, really clear in this series that maybe G two could have won. I think G two are still favored against Fnatic playing fair, but like definitely this this was like a coaching. A, the reason why they destroyed Fnatic is a coaching advantage, I would say. Uh, that's what yeah, I'm for this. Well, let me ask about some of the players though, because I feel like one of the reasons why I also really did want to just see a straight up proper best of five between Fnatic and G2 is because as we've just described, some of the players on Fnatic are like, in terms of Razork, I mean, he's arguably, he is better than Ike in my opinion, he has to do more. And you just look at their team, they have they have punching power, they have firepower, that's a key upside for them as a team. But actually one player I want to ask about is, look, that was a brilliant wax lyrical about Mickey X, but this has been a pretty rough Mickey X split though, right? Like this isn't yeah. a split where the MVP put that way. Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, I think that he, yeah, he's had a he's had a really really rough split. I have no idea why. Uh, I mean, when we when we say rough split, we mean like top four, sure. or top five, okay. four to the league. Okay. You know, right? sure. Like, I mean, it's all relative. Yes. Uh, but, uh, but but yeah, uh, it's 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 a bit it's a bit puzzling. Um, but uh, you know. Uh, We'll see how he does internationally. I, I, I really couldn't place it for for why, um, but maybe it's. I think uh, the other teams in the past, other teams were too focused maybe on shutting down caps. Whereas they saw, okay, you try to shut down caps. What's going to happen is Mickey. They're going to get priority two v two bot. Mickey's going to come to mid and he's going to like uh, alleviate that. So I think teams started like focusing more on shutting down the bot lane and then. That meant that Mickey couldn't really play the game that he wanted to in the early game. He had some really kind of questionable ganks to deaths. This this split, uh, deaths deaths to ganks. Sorry, this uh, this split. But as a result, Caps has just been able to do whatever he wanted. Uh, and you know, I think that's a that's a problem with with G two. You can't shut down both Mickey and Caps, uh, at least in Europe. Um, so so we'll have to see how things go internationally because I can guarantee you, looking at the mids who are at MSI, they're going to be playing through mid. So the question is. Mickey, how is the two v two bot going to work uh, against these Asian bot lanes? I and if they get the advantage, how is Mickey going to be able to influence the map? Because again, Yike is no longer a rookie, right? So this is last year. He had some games at international events where he was kind of outshone by other international junglers. Some of that, you know, he was sick at Worlds. You know, G two have talked about this, but now he's not a rookie anymore. So how is how is he going to use? Because Caps isn't going to be allowed to play internationally. Like Asian teams are not stupid; they've made the mistakes in the past. They are not going to let him play the game. So the question is, how can Yike and Mickey 
make up for the fact that all that attention from from Asian teams is going to go is going to go mid, and we'll, we'll learn a lot about about <clears throat> how G two how good G two really are at this international event because you know caps over pushing a side lane and dying and giving like Fnatic massive shutdown and multiple objectives back into a game when they're 6k gold ahead when G2 already 6k gold ahead and the game is already won is not going to tell us anything right it's how Mickey it's how Mickey and Yike at MSI Mickey and Yike at MSI and Razor for Fnatic are the European players we will really learn how strong our region is based on how how those guys do against the international competition by the way, the other thing I'll point out if someone's more of a casual viewer and they can't remember the whole split is the way you also know G2 was playing with their food is they're fucking letting people get pentakills before the game ends intentionally. Like, that, that, if it was any other team, half the segment now would be about how stupid that is. And it'll never work. But it's like, I can't even blame them. They just get away with it every time, mate. So fair enough. You can make that work. It is kind of gangster. I can't lie. I know why players like to do it. It's like extra disrespect. On the Caps point, though, the reason why it makes perfect sense, though, I agree, Peter. It's totally logical that these jungle supports are just going to fucking gangbang caps internationally like you, you should you'd be a fool not to because here's the problem with doing evaluation split to split week to week is people themselves even though they will do the hot take reaction to like a guy has a bad zero two week a guy has an insane three two zero week back in the day in lec they don't ever do that with their favorite players so what happens is people act like if faker actually smurfed and played like chovy did that i'd be hating on him like oh he's not that good is no that's when I'd be like, he's back. Holy shit, it's Faker again. Because I love when people play to a high, high level. But because I've seen so many games in these esports titles, I know that when someone's having an off split or they're just not effective at the time, or it might be something like maybe in the personal life they don't practice as much or they're thinking about where they're at in their career. There's been those years. There was times last year. There was times a couple of years ago, 2022 in the spring. There's times when Caps wasn't always claps and he wasn't the guy who it's like, me put him against Showmaker. Maybe he could beat him. Like there was times when he just came down to like best LEC mid but that wasn't the same as like could go against the Asian teams now it feels like he's in his ascendancy again this is this is yeah. the prime caps right there's there's almost no downside to this player is there uh, yeah for, for sure and uh, I mean basically okay I, I'm not going to say who but somebody on my staff sent me a really interesting statistic uh, the other day which is that if you want to know how seriously G2 took Fnatic in this final G2 are already on already uh, on China sleep time oh, they, 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 they're not they're not even like because we know from their solo queue accounts we know that multiple people on g2 didn't even sleep before the fanatic series they're they're, they're just they're just already on msi Fucking right they're, 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 they're... that's also pretty gangster too that's pretty cool, <laughs> pretty cool. I, I i don't know all f i don't no, know all okay. five of them but at least at least three okay i like on uh okay. like that's i mean i don't know i mean it, it just goes to show the value of an lec final that's in the studio <laughs> Like, I mean, uh, but yeah, I, I we'll see. You know, like it, it's all it's all very much it's all very good to you know when when you're like the the big boy in town. You know, you could you post all your screen results where you're stomping everybody. You like troll on stage. You don't need to sleep before an sure. NEC finals. You know, it's all it's all very well to go and do this. But then, okay, show that show that you deserve to to do this uh, on an international level, right? And and yeah, we'll we'll we'll, we'll go and see. Uh, but yeah, but like caps. <laughs> Like man, if if you've seen this guy for six or seven years, you know you know that like they're not they're they're not playing seriously. Like and there's different levels. There's different levels of trolling, right? Like there's there's but for fans, I think it's very easy for fans to go and say uh, to to go say, oh, it's just caps and it's just claps. But there's sometimes where where caps is like inting because he needs to int to come and make a play you know because the game sit close it's a really really close series and there's sometimes where it's just lack of focus and like this there, there was one death i remember i can't remember which game it was but he was on a zier they were pushing bot lane turret and broken blade was pushing tier two with tf on top lane oh yes uh, against Fnatic. yeah uh, it was game i can't remember whether it was game two or something but but and they just die for no reason like three people just die because obviously Fnatic know that TF can't reach across the map. So like five people go on them. It's 5v3 bot. And like that kind of thing is never going to happen in the international competition, right? right? Like it's just, it's just like lack of focus. Uh, I just quickly. It's game three. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, they, they won, they won that game like really, really hard game. It was game three, game three um, uh, against Fnatic. And yeah, you know, like I, 
yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't have more to say. Like, let's let's see, let's see how these teams do. I think Europe has looked a bit sloppy this season, but there are certain teams in Europe that are very. They have very strong fundamentals for how they want to play the game, right? They have very clearly checklist for how you want to do. And in spring split, in winter split, those teams all did super, super well, you know. But the teams, the teams that played in very like color by numbers style, didn't do as well in spring split. And I think that is promising for EU's chances at MSI. And it's not like I think in Razork and in Caps. There's definitely people that G2 and Fnatic can play around to like do damage to these Asian teams. So looking forward to it. Yes. Well, here's the tough question. I'm going to leave you with a hypothetical that I want an answer on. So we know already the four Asian teams that are going. We've got the mighty BLG who dominated LCK. We've got the, well, still to be seen, but, but in theory have dominated the, uh, the LPL, sorry. Then we've got Gen G who dominated the LCK, even though the finals was close. And then we have Top Esports, who's obviously, I, I would say, got stronger and stronger as, throughout the split and then had an amazing playoff run. Jackie loves back. And then you've got T1, you've got the mighty T1, the reigning world champions, right? So these four teams, which would you match up with G2 and say they have the best chance to beat? Uh, it's either T1 or Top. Uh, I okay. So I I'm gonna say top because I want to see that series. I because Cream this is like his first international tournament. Yeah. He's been like the hype guy forever. Yeah. And watching him against Caps is gonna be really really hype. Um, watching what yeah like they're a team that that can go really really crazy. They 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 have three six nine so that, that they know how to play weak side properly. It will be that series will be really really fun. I think it will come down a lot to. Mako versus Mickey because uh, and how they choose to set up their map. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that series. If I'm honest, I think T1 have the potential. <laughs> Do they have potential to lose a best of five? <laughs> they have the potential to drop games to G2. Okay. Uh, I'll say that. Uh, but uh, but yeah, definitely definitely for for C9. Uh, I think uh, I think uh, sorry not for C9 for G2. Uh, it's top. Actually, for a spicy one, who do I think have? Who do I think that uh, Fnatic have the highest Come chance on. to beat? Fnatic, I think, ha have the highest chance to beat uh, to beat BLG. Holy fuck! Holy <laughs> shit, bro! They have like the most insane fucking jungle mid in the world. They have <laughs> the best jungle mid in the world. But okay, hear me out. Hear me okay. out. Hear me out. Okay, the. the Oscar's biggest strength as a player is his laning phase, right? He's good 1v1, but he doesn't really know how to teamfight that well or how to play on the map that well, you know? So playing into Bin, he is, I think, the European player who is the best equipped to not get stomped into the floor. Okay. By and what I will say is, BLG don't get punished enough for some of the early game, like... They sometimes take risks in the early game, or they sometimes draft things that they shouldn't be allowed to do. And sure, their 2v2 is really, really insane, but if Razor can punish Jun, it's possible. It's it's not likely. It's okay, not likely. Okay. No, it's a spicy <laughs> but, yeah. but 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 of all of all the teams, I, I want to see BLG versus Fnatic. And I want to see because BLG are a team that's always really, really well prepped. So I want to see what BLG do to shut down Razor. And you know, sometimes Top Chinese teams underrate international competition. I'm really sure. sorry if you're a Chinese fan, right? Sometimes they do. And if BLG underestimate Fnatic, they're going to get like a, you know, an uppercut to the uh, uppercut to the jaw and then we'll see how strong their jaw is. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's the one I'm looking forward to, for sure. <laughs>